I'm Kira Morgan. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Coffee with Kira, sponsored by The Human Being in Newport and Lincoln City. And I'm excited to be here with Finn Johnson. He is with the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, otherwise known as OCVA, <laughs> and a relatively new physician. So, Finn, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Finn. I am working with the Oregon Coast Visitors Association um, in a role that's called the Coastal Tourism Resiliency Coordinator. Um, and, and largely that started to look at projects along the coast that can um, sort of channel an increase in what we've seen for um, tourists looking for sustainability and then also focusing on ways to make our communities um, more resilient as we're seeing. Um, you know, big storms, uh, king tide season right now, so we're seeing all sorts of reasons why we should be thinking about making our communities resilient, um, and also offering ways for uh, visitors to feel like they're positively impacting the coast, and that's where my role comes in. Um, and you work up and down the entire coast, is that right? Yes, that is. So yeah, I get the pleasure of Highway 101 is my commute, but have um, got to meet a lot of really cool people in this role and just working um, from all the way down south in Brookings. We've got some electric vehicle charging projects that are um, getting getting their feet under them in, in Gold Beach, for instance, all the way up to Astoria, which is where I'm living right now. Um, so partners all along the coast. So what are some ways that you work to try to increase tourism or get the word out about the coast? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, um, we're the tourism representatives. We're called the Regional Destination Management Organization. So we cover, um, like myself, the entire coast. And largely, historically, that's looked like marketing. Um, so marketing to different markets in uh, outside the state primarily, but um, saying come to the coast. Uh, for anyone who has been to the coast recently, you'll see, especially on the north coast, that um, folks already know we're here. Um, so a lot of our energies and efforts right now are, are focused towards tourism management, um, stewardship of place, and then also making sure that um, each dollar that comes into um, local com communities via tourism is um, circulating as long as possible and having as much of a net positive impact as possible. So um, the seafood work that the Oregon Coast Business Association is uh, undertaking right now um, is a good example of that. And what are some trends that you're seeing with tourism right now? Yeah, absolutely. So particularly because I'm, I'm you know, in that world, but thinking about it often, um, we're identifying a lot of trends that are looking towards sustainability as sort of the gold standard of travel. Folks are wanting to visit responsibly. Um, the majority of people are, are looking actually even to pay more if there's a responsible choice that they can take. So this is a really um, important thing to share with businesses, which is that not only are travelers increasingly wanting to travel in a way that um, is eco-conscious, is protective of place, pr protective of the things that they're traveling to a place for, um, which along the Oregon coast is our natural asset, it's the beauty of the Oregon coast, um, but also really thinking about the fact that people are actually willing to pay more. So over 50% of folks surveyed um, in a booking.com poll said that they actually would pay more um, for products, services, et cetera, that um, was sustainable, felt like they were doing good for that place, which is an important thing to share with businesses. And you recently did a presentation uh, for the Depot Bay Chamber, which was very well received. And you talked a little bit about how people are coming to the coast. Can you share that with our viewers and listeners? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so folks are increasingly traveling via electric vehicle. Um, and anyone who's been paying attention to politics on the on the West Coast has probably seen some legislation come down. California, Washington, okay. and, and Oregon have um, mandated all new electric vehicle sales, um, or all new vehicle sales, I should say, are electric by 2035. Um, so there's a lot of pressure from legislation towards, you know, making sure that we can accommodate electric vehicles. But the reality is, is that the coast is a place that you travel to um, via car. Right now, there are very few other options to get to the coast, and they're sort of niche. Um, so people visit in their cars, uh, and as electric vehicles replace traditional internal combustion engine cars, um, we're going to see an increase in demand for charging infrastructure. Um, that's an increase that's going to happen everywhere, but the sort of conundrum with tourism is that we have um, sort of rural levels of infrastructure with almost urban levels of demand that's sort of a um, big reason why tourism management is a focus on the North Coast, for instance, that sort of thing. But 
Um, essentially, what we're um, just being really cognizant of is if we don't proactively put in electric vehicle charging, um, there are going to be wait lines, there's going to be sort of holdups, there's going to be a term that's called charge anxiety is popped up already. And so, Finn, does the coast have enough electrical charging stations? I know we have a few and more businesses are kind of starting to put them in. Um, cities are starting to put a few of them in. Um, but is there enough to accommodate, do you think? Uh, so we've actually done, uh, we've compiled a couple different maps um, and so sort of built out a, a, a more comprehensive, I would say, map of um, what charging looks like on the coast. It can be found on our um, the People's Coast website. Um, that's the Oregon Coast Visitor Association website. But uh, what we've seen is there's about 200 chargers right now. Um, up along the coast, and there are actually some gaps. Um, so there are towns, there are cities that don't actually have charging capacity. Um, and frankly, there's not enough charging capacity anywhere. Um, so with the projected increased demand, and this actually even came before that legislation um, for mandating new vehicle sales be electric. Um, even before that, there was uh, a, a ODOT report that looked like we were going to actually have to increase charging um, capacity statewide by five times what it is right now. So put in five times as many chargers as already exist. Um, that's the same for the coast. In fact, I think one of the things that's really hard to tell um, is you know, movement flow between how people are starting and ending their travel and where they're going. You sort of have to use, um, I would say, pretty sophisticated data like GPS data, Bluetooth data that people are subscribing to. Um, so you, it's hard to build out that data, but we've heard anecdotally that there's already a lot of demand um, for charters that exist. Um, California is our neighbor down south. Washington is our neighbor up north. Um, Oregon is second in the country as far as electric vehicle adoption goes. California is number one. Washington is not far behind. All those things make us think that, that electric uh, vehicle charging infrastructure is um, a priority as far as making it so that um, anyone who's visiting in-state, but also coming from those two peripheral states um, and driving an electric vehicle can actually make their travel successful. Um, so right now, no, not for future demand. So we have to, um, in this moment, we have a chance to be proactive and put in more electric vehicle charging. Uh, what about hybrid vehicles? Uh, are those something that's also starting to see an increase? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, those are a little bit less of our concern as far as the charge infrastructure goes, just because you don't have this sort of um, charge anxiety that comes with only having, you know, a battery you can sort of default back to a um, gas-powered engine with those hybrids. So, um, yes, absolutely more and more, um, but it's a different sort of, um, you know, different sort of uh, problem because they're not... I guess it's just a different situation, yeah. Now, what about like hotels? Are hotels looking at getting mm -hmm. some charging stations that way folks can charge their car, say, overnight? And um, part B of that question is, do you know about how long it takes on average for these vehicles to charge? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's important to break down charging infrastructure just a little bit to answer that question, I think. Um, there's sort of two levels of public-facing charging infrastructure that you can implement um, that we're looking to implement on the coast. Level two charging is going to be more accessible cost-wise. It's going to be $1.5 to $6,000 to implement, um, to put in a, a level two electric vehicle charger. Um, those are That makes it sort of a reasonable ask for businesses. You know, the price point is reasonable for um, the more private side um, to sort of get involved with putting in EV infrastructure. Uh, those chargers are not similar to a gas station. That's going to be four to six hours um, to charge a car. Uh, it sort of depends too. As bigger models get rolled out, the um, F-150 Lightning, those are bigger batteries, so it's going to take longer. If it's a smaller car, it will you know take less than the Lightning, for instance. Um, but one of the things that's really important to be mindful of is um, if we're going to put in level two charger infrastructure, um, four to six hours. It's going to have to be in a place that is what we're saying amenity rich is the terminology we're using. So right, that was what I was going to yeah. say. Well, you know, you can go out to eat. That takes an yeah. hour right. if you're pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> Which comes back to your original question. Hotels are actually one of those places that we've identified as um, a, a great place to put level two chargers because instead of stopping and waiting for four hours, you're just parking your car overnight. 
Mm -hmm. um, so getting EV charter infrastructure in hotels is going to be actually maybe one of the sort of easiest ways to fill the gaps um, as far as charging goes. And then the other thing to just say um, with that conversation about different levels of charging infrastructure um, is there are level two chargers that are going to take four to six hours, and then there are level three DC fast chargers. Um, those chargers are going to be the gold standard of charging. It's going to take 30 to 40 minutes on average. For oh, a there you go. There's your yeah, meal. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's the only thing that's comparable to, to a gas station, you know, psychologically, if you're looking for that gas station, quick stop, get your stuff together, get going. It's going to be level three chargers. That's a bigger fish. Those are going to be eighty to one hundred and forty thousand dollars to install each level three charger. Um, so we're working with partners, but that's going to largely come from um, national organizations, cities that are being proactive, and then um, state ODOT money as well. So yeah, there's different opportunities for partnership, but for businesses, those level two chargers are going to be a great option to get. Um, actually, maybe some more business in the door. People are going to stop, hang out, might come come down and check out what's going on. Um, and let's talk about other ways that the coastal areas are looking at being more eco-friendly to tourists. You mentioned in your presentation uh, there was a hotel that's uh, giving back to the community via, via tourism dollars. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's sort of, as far as protecting our natural assets, which is our beautiful coastline, our natural world outside, um, there's a couple different strategies you can take. You can reduce initial impact. That might look like driving an electric car versus a gas-powered one. You can also, on the sort of back end, mitigate the impact that um, inevitably happens when you travel or use the space. Um, and yeah, that example that you just shared is one of the ones that we're using as sort of a highlight on the coast that others hopefully can replicate. Um, but the Overleaf um, and the Overleaf Lodge and Fireside Motel down in Yahats um, have implemented something of a give back donation system. So tourist dollars are directly going to um, two local organizations. Um, one is the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve and then the other is the 804 Trail in Yahats. Um, and essentially the model is $1 every night gets tacked on to a hotel room. Um, if you're a traveler, you can opt out of that situation or out of that donation. So you can say, I'd rather not actually, but um, what those, uh, what Drew Rosen shared with us, he's um, managing partner of the Overleaf and, and Fireside, he showed that um, every summer about five people opt out. And so the net total donation for those two establishments has been um, around $30,000 um, per year, which is really cool. And so it's a way to channel directly tourism money and sort of give it back to the communities and make sure that the um, you know all those great features of why we come here and why we love this place get protected. Well, and it also uh, takes a little bit of the burden off of the locals as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise that management, all the financial um, side of you know making sure that these organizations have money to maintain the things we love, that falls on um, local communities. So it's a way to sort of channel some of those tourism dollars. And you're doing some things online to make people more aware. Let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Uh, Half of that idea is um, the opt-out style, where a hotel or a business can plug in an automatic donation to their point of sale system. Um, another alternative model is something that we've actually um, sort of been replicating. Uh, Visit Iceland has a really cool calculator, for instance, where you can calculate where you're coming from and where you're going, and then it spits out sort of an estimate of your um, impact on the world, and then you can donate actually to Iceland's Wetland Restoration Fund. Um, so you can sort of mitigate the impact of your travel in that way. We're, we're actually putting together a calculator right now that's going to be um, hosted on our website, but we're, we're going to be able to share um, portals with businesses that they can set up so that folks who are visiting can um, scan a QR code and then um, you know, do a little calculation and check out um, what their impact is and then also give money back to the coast to sort of mitigate that. Um, so that's a really exciting way that uh, we can let Travelers who are interesting or increasingly interested in sort of taking responsibility for the travel and traveling sustainable, sustainably, uh, give them an option essentially so that they can um, do that and also support those things that they love and that we love. Yeah, that's amazing, Finn. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share? Uh, I think this is just a really exciting time to um, be open to a lot of opportunities that businesses can take advantage of as far as 
um, ways to increasingly attract people who are eco-conscious and interested in sustainability and also just sort of um, reduce you know, our, our net impacts generally. Um, one of those is um, a USDA grant that is uh, efficiency and uh, renewable energy grant for businesses, um, as well as a loan option that's, um, we can, we'll share this on our industry newsletters. Um, please feel free to sign up. Um, it's at thepeoplescoast.com. Um, but that's a grant that uh, is, a, is called REAP, R-E-A-P. Um, and so that's sort of an exciting thing that we've been sharing with businesses. But it's an exciting time to just stay tuned. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff in the works. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today on Coffee with Kara. Again, sponsored by The Human Being in Newport at 6th Street and Highway 101. And in Lincoln City at the north end of the highway on the west side next to TLC Credit Union. Reporting for Oregon Coast Breaking News, I'm Kira Morgan.